Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Cloud Native Live, where we dive deep into the code behind Cloud Native. I'm Annie Talvasto, and I am a CNCF ambassador as well as a product marketing manager at Cast AI, a Kubernetes cloud cost optimization company. Very much a welcome on my part. So every week, we bring uh, a new set of presenters to showcase how to work with Cloud Native technologies. They will build things. They will break things and they will answer your questions. Join us every Wednesday at 11 a.m. ET. So this week we have the pleasure to have Alex Chaikorp. Chaikorp. <laughs> Hopefully I'm not too much butchering the name. You can give the <laughs> correct pronunciation soon. Here us with us to talk about a very exciting topic. Um, so join us for KubeCon plus Cloud Native Con Virtual North America, October 11th to 15th, to hear the latest from the Cloud Native community. Uh, as always, this is an official li live stream of the CNCF, and as such is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. So please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct, basically. Be respectful of all of your fellow participants and presenters. With that, I hand it over to Alex to kick off today's presentation. Thank you so much, Anna. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're watching. Um, really excited to be uh, to be presenting today, and uh, and hopefully um, you wouldn't have jinxed the demo gods, and my demo will just work. <laughs> Um, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, if we can switch to the slides. Brilliant. So I'm going to be talking today about Kubernetes and persistent data and stateful workloads, um, which which I'm sure is um, something which is very you know commonly uh, a very common pain point in, in many use cases when, when using uh, Kubernetes. So before we start a little bit a little bit about myself, uh, my name is Alex Kirkop. Um, I'm very, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about storage. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of Storage OS where we're um, building a software defined cloud native storage platform. Um, but I also have two hats. I'm, I'm the co-chair for the CNCF storage tag um, that was formerly the CNCF uh, storage SIG. And basically, my background is is uh, in engineering and uh, uh, and infrastructure, and I did that for twenty five years before the the startup bug um, got me and and you know promoted me into this into this uh, into this uh, direction and adventure, which is which is pretty cool. Um, as always, we'll try and keep this interactive. So if, if there are questions, please feel free to stick them in the chat and I'll try and answer them as we go along or, or at, the, at an opportune moment in the presentation. Um, I'm going to do a little shameless plug um, with my with my co-chair hat on. Um, I'd like to just um, sort of mention that the um, a lot of the topics that we're talking about today are the sort of topics and, and, and technical work that we do um, as part of the tag storage in in, um, in the CNCF. We meet uh, every couple of weeks and all the calls are open, membership is open, so please feel free to join the calls and uh, contribute and join the mailing lists and uh, help us build uh, our storage community, which which I think would be um, really beneficial. Okay, with that plug out of the way, I'm going to talk a little bit about just to set the scene, the the, the journey to cloud native that we see um, a lot of uh, organizations, big and small, uh, doing to when they when they when they start uh, when they first adopt this 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 new paradigm, um, and really, you know. <clears throat> This is kind of obvious, but obviously, you know, developers starting off with with containers is the first is the first step. The big thing that containers do is it kind of it, it breaks that lock in to individual servers, right? So so we we now have portable codes that can run anywhere, and obviously, by allowing codes to run anywhere, you um, you enable the ability to automate code, and of course. Um, you know that's where Kubernetes comes in, and Kubernetes is now the de facto container orchestrator that allows the automation of applications in 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 just about any environment. In fact, 
you know, you can think of Kubernetes as a layer that abstracts the the infrastructure and, and provides developers with um, a way of composing what their application needs. So, so, so developers can now say, my application is um, formed of these containers and it needs this amount of CPU and this amount of memory and these sort of networking requirements and, and Kubernetes can just go ahead and make that happen and can all, also automate, you know, <clears throat> not just the deployment, but also scaling, healing, um, and, and, a, and a variety of other um, advanced features too. So when we talk about Kubernetes, how, how, how are many organizations doing this? And, and there's, there's, there's a mix of different things in play. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm showing this to kind of show the diverse ways of, of doing Kubernetes that, that we see in real life because Kubernetes is this abstraction layer for, for infrastructure. So, you know, there's, there are all of the um, self-managed um, and, you know, common distributions that we see um, with, uh, with, with Kubernetes, you know, products like Rancher and OpenShift and, um, and, and, and even, you know, simple things like, like KubeADM where, where we can provision and manage our own uh, Kubernetes clusters. Of course, there are Kubernetes services which are available in, in, in all the public clouds and there are more and more, um, uh, you know, managed service providers and, and, and service providers of all sizes providing managed Kubernetes services too. And of course, you know, you have, you also have, um, environments running on laptops. So the, the nice thing about using Kubernetes means that you can have the same a uh, bit of YAML that defines your application and whether you're running it on your laptop, um, on premise, on big bare metal environments in the cloud and managed service providers, or in fact, you know, using any number of, of the certified CNCF distributions, you get the same, uh, you get the same uh, user experience and the application can, can run everywhere. So, when, when we're talking about some of the applications and, and, and you know, we're, we're Quoting um, a Datadog survey here in terms of you know the, the top containers that are that are running um, in in um, in people's environments, we kind of see that you know there are some um, platforms which are uh, which don't require state and some platforms which are ephemeral. We we obviously have a lot of uh, most most uh, end users start with some sort of um, stateless or or ephemeral workload. You know perhaps Nginx, perhaps, perhaps Redis. Um, and you have, you know, things like um, Nginx can, is, is really easy to deploy without, without um, storage. Um, and it's kind of easy to create and delete instances of, of the product. And, and the same sort of thing applies for Redis in, in a very, um, in a very simple, uh, in a very simple configurations. However, um, We'll talk a little bit about why applications need state and why I think you know all applications need to store state somewhere. So that's the spoiler. Um, but the, the 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 key thing here is that um, ephemeral workloads kind of have um, problems because they always need to refer to something that's going to be storing data somewhere, right? And that can be a service, it can be a database, it can be an object store, it can be a file system. Um, and and therefore, what we what we end up seeing is a lot of legacy environments. You know, whether it's it's simple EC2 instances running in in your cloud or VMs running alongside your 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 Kubernetes instance. Um, and of course, the the what this means is that even the applications that can run ephemerally tends to be running in a less optimal way because those um, those systems can now um, um, can can now not use the, the uh, storage system that's available to them. So, for example, um, you know, re recovery times for these applications can be longer, and it, it can be it can take um, a, a lot of time to warm up these systems, like like caches, like Redis, for example. And so, you kind of end up with a ton of scaffolding that is put around these systems. You know, and we 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 start detracting from the benefits that Kubernetes provides. So for example, you know, one of the one of the workarounds that, that we kind of commonly see is where 
we we remove the ability of Kubernetes to dynamically place um, application workloads based on you know capacity or or um, or utilization of the nodes, and and we we start tying down applications to individual nodes, um, and and this is this is a really big challenge because the whole point of of Kubernetes is there to to abstract away the infrastructure, but what we see is um, storage, in in to a large extent, is and still is um, something that you present and bind to a server. And what we're and what we need to to move away from, and what we need to start thinking about is how do we make storage composable, and how do we start making storage um, uh, bound to the application? Because at the end of the day. Uh, it's the application that needs to move around. It's the application that needs to be dynamic. We've we've done all of the work to move to make an application portable by containerizing it, um, and the storage now needs to be able to follow the applications. So so here's the 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 sort of you know my my premise, and it's 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 not always it's not always obvious, and it's not always a, you know um, <laughs> a popular statement, but I'll, I'll I'll go ahead and say it. You know, I think all applications store state somewhere, right? Um, even even um, even the most simplest of applications will store data in a file or a database or an object store or, or a key value store or a message bus or, or streaming or, or or something, right? There's there's always going to be something there. Um, and the question is then, once you're using Kubernetes. How do you make, take advantage of? Um, how, how do you take advantage of Kubernetes to to actually automate the the storage? And 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 the answer is you know cloud native storage. And there's there's there's, there's obviously a, a wide variety of of uh, of options here. What we're going to focus on a little bit today is is software defined um, options because you know we talked about all of the different ways that people can use Kubernetes, whether it's you know, on laptops, in in managed services, in uh, cloud providers, on prem, et cetera, et cetera, um, and and therefore, if you've made your application portable, you've made your application composable. You've you've got composable memory and compute and networking. Why wouldn't you also want composable storage? And why wouldn't you also want portable storage that's that's available in 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 every environment? And that's where that software defined cloud native storage comes in. So, and, and we'll kind of make it one step further. Um, in much the same way now that, that developers can uh, compose what they need in terms of CPU memory and network, you also have the ability now for developers to compose what they need from the storage and, and, and have that storage uh, be application centric. And, and fundamentally, it allows you to, it allows developers and DevOps teams to, to move any of the applications uh, and, and take advantage of Kubernetes for any application and, and, and specifically, you know, build anything as a service. Because the, the, the other effect of, um, of being able to compose this is that you can now create a, a database as a service, or, or say, a message bus as a service, or, or even you know, with 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 some of the, um, with some of the uh, CNCF projects like Kubevert, for example, where you know Kubernetes can actually manage VMs. Um, you can even create infrastructure as a service, you know, and, and, and in fact, we we certainly have clients um, managing, you know, uh, VMs in 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 that sort of environment. So, what we're kind of saying with with a software defined cloud native storage is kind of treating persistent data like networking technologies, and and this is kind of a given, right? So so whether if in 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 all of the different environments, you know, you have a variety of different CNI providers. Which effectively give you the capability of um, having software-defined network systems that that provide meshes, that provide uh, service discovery, that provide routing and 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 services in in Kubernetes, and all of those services run um, natively as daemon sets. And people just don't think about it. It's one of those things that's just there. And what we're basically saying is that you can have the same sort of things with the software-defined storage. So of course, you know, storage OS is one of those. But again, with my CNCF. Um, go chair hat on. You know there are obviously a, a number of different um, projects in this in this space, but effectively we can have uh, an operator or a daemon set that can operate in these environments. And 
what we what we then get is we get the ability to effectively you know abstract the storage that's in your kubernetes um, environment and provide a platform agnostic way um, for applications to access the storage um, the the key thing here is you you now have that portability so applications can move to any nodes um, nodes can fail um, and that's a really important usage pattern here, right? Because in Kubernetes clusters, um, if you're going to, you know, upgrade versions, if you're going to patch versions, if you're going to use, say, spot instances, etc., you generally have dynamic clusters where nodes come and go, and nodes can be upgraded on the fly. So, so applications just move around a lot more in a Kubernetes world, and, and therefore being able to, to have that, that, that you know, in, in a similar way that you can sort of create a, a service mesh in the networking space, you kind of need, um, you, you kind of effectively have the same sort of space, uh, the same sort of mesh in, in the storage space that, that allows you to access the storage from everywhere. And Kubernetes has done, uh, you know, a really good job of of creating um, the concept of uh, storage classes. And storage classes um, effectively define a way of dynamically provisioning um, volumes and accessing those volumes. So, a storage class is kind of a very fancy way of saying this is a name that I give to a group of uh, to, to a group of volumes. Um, it, it tends to refer to um, a driver. Almost every Kubernetes deployment nowadays will have some sort of default um, storage class. Um, but, the, but the nice thing here is you can create um, storage classes with different services, you know, of course, depending on the um, the projects you're using and the, <clears throat> and the cloud providers you're using to actually do different things for different purposes. So, so for example, you may have um, a storage class that you use for for um, development workloads, where where perhaps you you're you're not actually interested about availability or or or, or replicas, but you're interested in just making sure that the data is available across all of the nodes. You might have um, a production system where you 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 want uh, to focus on availability and you want um, data to be replicated across different nodes in the cluster you know to protect against say disk failures or node failures or or, or that sort of thing um, you may use um, storage classes to define um, a security level where where perhaps you might have you know certain RBAC rules or policies or 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 encryption um, enabled um, and you might also you know have storage classes that affect um, Things like the the uh, data the data redundancy or the or the data compression capabilities um, for you know say archive or, or or data which is which is not often used or very cold um, and just as a and just as an example um, you know I've got a storage class listed here on the left the storage class as I said is is kind of a very you know, it's 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 really quite a a, a basic thing, uh, a small piece of YAML typically, where um, you have uh, you have an, a name. In this case, in this example, the name is production. For example, you'll have a provisioner which refers to um, a CSI driver. Uh, CSI is the container storage interface which um, Kubernetes will use um, as a as a standardized API to to talk to a variety of of different systems and. I think at present count there must be 50 or 60 um, different uh, different CSI drivers out there, um, and you'll then have a number of parameters that might define, um, you know, things like secrets or or the number of replicas or or, or things like that, which which would which might be specific to you know a certain um, a certain uh, storage driver. Um, but effectively, that's that's where you know the, the definition of storage stops, right? Because from then on, um, applications can just use um, persistent volume claims, and a persistent volume claim is effectively just a way of saying, I'm an application, and I want to have data which is persistent and stateful, and I want to give it a name which I can then reference in my applications. So, in this case, for example, we're, we're the the persistent volume claim is is the is the box on the right, um, and we have uh, uh, we're, we're creating uh, a PVC which is called MySQL PVC. Um, 
presumably for a MySQL database. Um, and in in general, the only thing that that you'll that you'll need to specify is something simple like the size, because um, everything else gets inherited um, through the storage class, um, which in this case, you know, we're referring to the production storage class defined on the left. Um, and and the thing is, you know. Using these using these um, capabilities, you can do um, a lot of advanced things. So, some systems, for example, support the use of of encryption and, and have automation with um, uh, Kubernetes secrets or external um, uh, key management services to to automatically um, encrypt the data. Um, typically, that's done through the use of some sort of labels or other parameters, um, as as you can see in this in this uh, example here. Um, and applications, like in this case, um, MySQL, for example, can can rely on 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 persistent data, and they'll just continue to run. Um, you know, and, and we can kind of see the scaffolding and those legacy uh, environments um, fading out into the background, and, and Kubernetes coming out and being able to use all of the power of Kubernetes here. And, and if you look at the example YAML um, on the right, we can kind of see. Um, we can kind of see an example of that of that MySQL database and what it would take to run. So, I'll I'll, I'll just sort of talk you through it very quickly. Here we have um, um, a really simple definition where we're saying we're creating a MySQL instance um, using the MySQL container. Um, we're defining a mount point. Uh, which is which is effectively a Unix part within the container namespace that's going to mount um, that's going to mount a volume, and we're um, and that volume is called MySQL dash data, and then what we're saying is we're saying that the volume MySQL data is actually to use the persistent volume claim called MySQL PVC. So so what what happens in this in this instance when the when the container is being scheduled, is that um, the 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 attach request will be issued via the CSI API. Um, Kubernetes will will attach the, the the volume to the node where it needs to run uh, MySQL, um, and then that will be mounted and put into the container namespace. And effectively, as far as the MySQL instance is concerned; it's 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 accessing a local volume, but of course that 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 volume is is actually persistent and and is and is available across uh, across container mounts. And if the demo gods uh, smile down on me, I'll 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 show a little demo of running a MySQL um, a MySQL image uh, in just that fashion in a minute. Um, another thing which is which is worth pointing out is that. Um, Volumes, for example, with um, with uh, Kubernetes, cannot can be read write once or read write many. Read write many volumes um, effectively allow a volume to be used by multiple pods at the same time uh, on different nodes. Um, and this is uh, you know sometimes this, this could be implemented um, via NFS, um, but there are you know a variety of different um, file systems which which allow these services. Um, and one of the key things here is, um, you know, there are many applications that that benefit from from having uh, a shared volume that they can refer to. Perhaps it's um, sharing some some common reference data or some common uh, config. Um, sometimes it's just you know uh, using um, a file system as a as a message bus. As 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 horrible as that sounds, you you, you often have uh, you often have environments where um, you have a workload, uh, a, a workflow of, of of transforms, for example, where you know one application hands over to another application across across a shared file system, and these sorts of things are 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 very common work uh, workloads which you can find in many Kubernetes environments, and it's it's a it's a very effective way of doing it. Um, and of course, you know you also have um, you also can unlock a lot of additional functionality using the persistent storage. For example, Redis becomes more than just an ephemeral cache and becomes you know a full blown uh, database um, with uh, with with persistent storage. You know and and, and enables a, a whole suite of of different and and, and advanced use cases. 
And the other thing um, that that we often see more and more now is with with the use of GitOps is the ability of actually having a standardized way of um, deploying uh, applications across your different uh, your different Kubernetes use cases. So, for example, you know how we said earlier on that you can have a variety of different Kubernetes um, distributions. Some might be on prem, some might be in the cloud, some might be on on laptops and things like that. Well, what you can have is you can have um, storage classes with the same name in each of those um, different environments but defined with different specifications as needed by those by those environments so you can have the same uh, the same piece of yaml to start the same database for example and have no replication uh, on your laptop and have you know uh, replication with with for for production availability when it's on prem and maybe add encryption if you're running in the cloud for example um, and and those sort of things mean that that you know it, it makes it that much easier for ci cd environments um especially when 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 managed by by GitOps processes um to 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 evolve in those in those spaces okay then um so that takes me neatly onto um the demo. Um, so this this is the bit where uh, things get a little scary. I will stop sharing that screen and I will share my um, I will share my can you see that okay? Yes, I can see it very well. And let's hope the demo gods will be uh, kind today. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. If 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 something goes wrong, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it. And as usual, just feel free to ask questions at, at any point. So um, I've just, uh, just, just for reference, I've, I've aliased K to, to cube cuddle, um, just because it's easier to type. Um, so what we have here is we have um, a three node uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, I'm going to use uh, K9S, which if you haven't used it before, it's an amazing tool to, to be able to explore and manage your, uh, your clusters. So here I'm looking at the kube system namespace, which obviously has you know, things like Cilium uh, running in there, which is you know the daemon set for the networking. You'll see other things like Kube Proxy and um, and Core DNS, for example, which are other services there. And in this case, I've got um, a storage OS daemon set running in there to provide uh, to provide the the um, the cloud native uh, software defined storage capabilities. So we'll 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 switch that to the default namespace instead. I just want to um, uh, I just want to get a list of the storage classes. So in this case, we've got a storage class conveniently enabled fast. Um, and and again, you know, similar to to the to the description we did when we were looking at the slides. You can kind of see the storage class is, is a really simple definition where it it, it defines um, a CSI driver. We see um, a bunch of parameters, and that's really it. And when we if we if we switch back to uh, K9s and look at the running systems, you'll you'll tend to see something like a CSI helper here, which which has um, a number of different uh, CSI functions in there to to do things like provisioning and attach um, volumes and, and 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 that's effectively the API endpoint that, that Kubernetes will be talking to when when looking to provision a volume. So um, on the um, if if you if you have a look at uh, docs.storageos.com, you have a whole section of use cases where we have put together you know, a number of simple examples covering MySQL, Postgres, Redis, um, you know, Kafka, Jenkins, even Kubevert. Um, and those are those are some some fun things to to try if uh, if you want. For today I'm going to be looking at uh, a MySQL uh, 
uh, a MySQL demo. So what we have in our MySQL demo is um, we have a little bit of YAML that defines um, what we want out of the MySQL database. So the first is um, MySQL will have a service account. We have uh, a MySQL service that, um, that uses ports uh, 3306 in this case and allows us to access MySQL transparently within, um, within the environment. Um, there's a little bit of config for MySQL. And then we define a stateful set. So a stateful set is effectively um, one of the one of the objects, uh, one of the management controller objects that that Kubernetes supports. Um, it's a stateful set is what's used um, when we're defining um, stateful workloads, um, and Kubernetes does uh, does a good job of of making sure that stateful workloads um, have uh, extra functionality. Like for example, um, it protects it protects stateful workloads from um, from running in multiple instances and it protects them from partition events and things like that uh, as, as, as one of the few things as, as one of the things that differs between say stateful sets in the standard uh, container or deployment um, and what we can see with the stateful set similar to the to the example that we were um, just looking at is we have a uh, we have a volume map point called data and it's mounted within the container as varlib mysql and we have the volume claim where we have data and it's using the fast storage class that we created that that was created earlier and we're saying that we want um a 5g uh, sorry a, a 5 gig um uh, sized volume um so what I will do is I will just look to create that MySQL workload. I'll just switch to the default namespace. That will be obvious. OK, so we created them. We can see the containers creating. There's a client container and the MySQL database uh, container, which is, which is just creating now. What we can see is The, uh, we have the MySQL database uh, has created um, a persistent volume claim called data MySQL zero. And if we describe the PVC, um, we can see the we can see the persistent volume um, being provisioned dynamically and being automatically uh, attached and being mounted. And if we look within the MySQL container, so I'll just start a shell within that container. We can effectively see that Kubernetes has mounted the volume into the Kubernetes into the MySQL namespace as Farlib MySQL. So as far as as far as the pod is concerned, it's just running um, with a persistent volume under Varlib MySQL. It doesn't know it's Farlib that it's a persistent volume. It's completely abstracted. It's just another file. It's just like another local file system. So. <clears throat> What we, what what I'll do now is, whoops, what I'll do now is I will get I will show the databases. So that's those are just like the standard um, databases uh, that 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 we would have in a in a in a simple MySQL system. What I'm going to do is. I am going to create a database and we'll go with something more creative than Alex and call this CNCF Live. And now when we 
show the databases, um, CNCF Live is, is there listed as a database. So what I'm going to do, um, what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll start by actually doing something, you know, pretty drastic. In a normal environment, if we, um, if we deleted the stateful set, um, we would obviously lose all the data because it would just be um, ephemeral data. And that um, and, and, and that, that database that we just created would, would be gone for good. But what we'll do is we'll, we'll delete the database. And we can see the database terminating within, uh, within K9S. Come on. And what we can see, though, is if we list the PVCs, we can see that the PVC is still there and it's still available, even though it's no longer um, attached to, to any workload. If we create the workloads again, And that's that took a couple of seconds. Um, I think it was just downloading the container. Um, and what we can see is if we uh, go to show the databases, the database is still there, and we can see that that you know the data has persisted um, across restarts. Now, what we also just just to kind of take that um, demo, and this is a really simple and a very boring demo, but but it, it it does show sort of the 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 flexibility and and the and the and the power of 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 having that that cloud native storage. But what we'll do is just to just to sort of prove that I'm not actually you know making this up um, and 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 you know cheating in any way, we'll we'll actually cordon the nodes that the workload is working on. And this will kind of give us an idea of what um, of what the the availability will look like. And I'm actually going to terminate it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually going to terminate that that pod now. So that's been deleted. And what we'll see now is that Kubernetes, because it's a stateful set, will go and recreate um, the workload. You can see it's um, we, it was previously running on F3, and now it's running on F8. The container is just restarting. It's probably just downloading. There we go. And it's running again. And if we look to show the databases, we can just see the databases are there. So that that seems like a really simple and boring demo, but effectively what's happened there is the database was shut down. Um, it restarted automatically on another node within seconds, continued to access the same persistent data that it had before. The service IPs were automatically redirected um, to the new node. Um, and the client continued to be able to connect to the to the database um, and access the data. So, so effectively, you have a fully HA um, service that's that's automated um, with the power of, of Kubernetes and and persistent volumes. And this is something which is available in all of your clusters today. So, I strongly suggest that you go out and try it. Um, and if you have uh, any questions, happy to answer them. Perfect. Uh, I think the boring and, and simple demos are usually the best as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So now is the time for the audience to, to ask questions. 
um, if I got that correctly. So so ask away people and, and leave the questions to the um, chat area so we can get some conversation going on, of course, as well. Waiting, waiting, looking forward to the questions from everyone. Indeed. Yeah, and I, and I think actually the demo gods were behaving very nicely, so it's, it was all good. <laughs> so far, so good. I, I, I've had so many instances where broadband played up or, or, or VPN stopped working. <laughs> I know, I know exactly the feeling. I think I've, every time I, I do a demo and if, if there's something that needs to like spring up or whatnot, WordPress or anything that takes a, like a few minutes, when I try it out before the demo, it takes, let's say, one minute to two minutes. And then during the demo, it always takes seven minutes. And I'm just so typical. <laughs> every time. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, but while we wait for the audience questions, uh, I can maybe ask a few to get the conversation started. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so you mentioned uh, in the beginning that there's a lot of CNCF projects in the space that are doing a great work and are doing kind of interesting things. So what are your favorites and why? So that's, um, okay, that's 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 a very good question. So when we talk about um, persistent storage in, in the CNCF, um, it covers actually quite a wide variety of different technologies. So, you know, persisting data can be done in any number of ways. The most, the most um, obvious thing is a um, is volumes, where we have you know block stores and, and file systems. Um, but we also have you know a huge number of systems which are of, of course accessed via APIs, and that can be. Um, databases, key value stores, object stores, for example. Um, and so when when we one of the one of the things that we did, um, one of the first things we did as as part of the SACO, which is now the tag, is to create um, uh, a, a cloud native storage white paper that kind of defines all of those different options and and both you know the the data part of how you access those different systems but also the control plane management and, and and how you automate things like dynamic provisioning and access of these of these different systems um and we actually also defined um because you know one of the interesting things here is that for the first time ever um developers actually get to choose what storage systems they need that they, they want to use so it's it's um it's more complicated than you'd imagine. There's there's obviously a lot of different options available for for different use cases, um, and so you know we we kind of encourage users to understand what attributes their application requires um, from from their from their system to, um, and we define the number of attributes like um, availability and um, you know performance and. Uh, durability uh, and data protection and these sort of things um, which which um, which which can affect um, what 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 you need out of your storage system some of the some of the projects that we have um, in uh, the tag storage includes things like um, etcd which is which is obviously a key value store and it's 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 used as as I guess the the brains of of every kubernetes cluster out there um, there are um, projects like uh, ti TIKV or um, TIKV, which is um, which is a distributed, uh, which is another distributed key value store. There are also um, products like um, uh, Vitesse, which are which which came out of YouTube, and is a distributed um, database, for example. And we're actually talking about some of these things and some of the different storage attributes in in our KubeCon uh, presentation in. I guess just over a month away. So attend that as well if you want to hear more about about uh, those those different projects. Perfect, nice plug there as well for uh, KubeCon and CloudNativeCon that's upcoming in a month. Um, yeah, and I think there's an audience question which is very, very exciting. Um, I will just read it out loud so you can get to answering. Uh, will you share some observations, the story, preferences, or recommendation for distributed storage in Kubernetes? Um, they'd especially in, be interested in anything related to multi-cluster Kubernetes persistence. For example, do you tend to prefer application-centric storage, which method of persistence is tailored for the app as opposed to general purpose file system or block storage? Okay, so there's, there's a bit to unpack there. Um, 
again, the 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 question the question is not about you know it, it's it's hard to make a recommendation one way or another simply because there are lots of different systems available and and they're optimized for um, for different use cases. So you know some systems might be um, optimized for for latency and and transactions. Um, others might be um, optimized for sequential throughput and and analytics, for example. And, and and they would be very very different systems. So it's it's hard to make a generic recommendation. The the, the reality is that there are um, that there are a number of different um, file systems, software defined storage systems, uh, object stores, um, databases, et cetera, that, that fit different use cases. So, so more than anything else, understand the use case. That said, application centric storage, I think is the is the key. Um, the, the, the point behind that is that if you have um, an application which is, um, and you want to be able to compose it, you need to actually link it to the storage and we have in in Kubernetes, we have like we we discussed today, um, the concept of of volumes, and and that's probably the most mature um, uh, functionality. But application centric storage um, can also refer to things like object stores, and there's there's now um, the Cozy in initiative, which is which which enables the the orchestration of things like. Um, um, uh, object store buckets and, and 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 access and that can 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 um, define those sort of access uh, methods as well. Um, so so although you know Kubernetes started with volumes, I think we're we're seeing extensions into into different areas. And of course, you know there are also um, an explosion of of operators using different operator frameworks to to provision things like distributed um, databases and 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 things like that as well. Um, in terms of in terms of multi cluster, that's certainly a a um, uh, a fairly immature process. But what we're seeing um, in 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 a lot of environments is that um, the customers or or enterprises and organizations are deploying a larger number of smaller clusters, um, perhaps clusters for you know specific applications or specific projects rather than have these these huge multi-tenanted you know big scalable clusters. So I think more than ever before um, there is the need and therefore you know projects will be working on this to to provide the capability to consume storage across clusters but also to to replicate and move data across um, across clusters. Um, and we're we're kind of seeing also um, some work being done in in hybrid environments where we're looking at uh, the ability of sharing storage between Kubernetes and say you know traditional uh, traditional systems. Um, whether it's it's because those traditional systems haven't yet been made the transition into Kubernetes or because you know they can't uh, be migrated for for whatever reason you know perhaps they're they're using some old code or something um so so I think I think that is that is always going to be a factor um when it comes to sort of API versus volumes is the, sort of the last bit of that of that question um again I don't think there's a particularly um good answer for that in the sense that even if you're going to persist storage, say, with a key value store, or you're going to persist storage with, with an object store, um, ultimately, that object store is going to be using a volume or a file system at some point in the back end. So, so it, it kind of depends depends on where you are in the in the platform owner stack right if if you're if you're the if you're the person responsible for building the database as a service you probably are going to want uh, to focus on the volumes and if you're um, the person who's uh, wants to consume the database as a service you probably only care about the database and so it it, it really you know that 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 answer is is kind of conditionless to where you sit in the in the in the stack and and what your what your focus is perfect very uh, informative and good answer uh, hopefully uh, QR courier got the, what they wanted out of there um, hopefully pronouncing a very difficult name correctly here again uh, <laughs> um uh, anyone else if you have any questions now is the time to put them to the chat as well we welcome every question all questions so far really nice questions actually a few questions i think in within this one one comment there so that's in, good. indeed 
Yeah. Um, maybe while we see if anyone else has anything to ask, um, I have another question I'm always interested in, um, because we usually, I think these kind of discussions focus on, okay, what's happening currently in the CNCF landscape, what's happening in, in these projects and everything. So where do you see the future of all of these projects as well as, um, storage in Kubernetes going, where do you think it's going to be going in one, two, few years from this point onwards? <sighs> So, I mean, that's okay. That's 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 an interesting question. So, so I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a move to data services and data management. Um, so, as um, you know, I kind of say this a lot, and it's 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 a, <laughs> people people in 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 my team kind of roll their eyes every time I say this, but I I, I strongly believe cloud is not a place um, in the sense that. What I think um, people want out of cloud environments is the the on-off consumption model, the the self-provisioning, the automated deployments and automated operations. And I think you, you're 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 able to get that now through a number of different services, not least of which, of course, is is Kubernetes, because effectively, you know, Kubernetes gives you that that composable um, environment, which can be running everywhere from your laptop to big bare metal boxes to VMs. So, so what I think is um, we'll, we'll see a lot more um, focus on the requirements for application-centric storage. We'll see a lot more focus on data mobility and the ability to move um, applications between different environments. So for example, a very common pattern that's that's coming up nowadays is um, being able to develop on prem and deploy in the cloud, or develop in the cloud and deploy on prem. For example, um, we'll also see um, the use of storage um, becoming key in um, diagnostics and, and 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 other debugging purposes. So, so for example, the ability to, to have uh, copies of data. Um, which which are used for analytics or or diagnostics um, separate to the production environment, um, and I think we'll also see um, we'll also see uh, the the emergence of of more mission critical services. So so you know the concept of cloud native disaster recovery, um, and in fact that that is a document um, that we're working on. Um, that that we've been recently working on in the SIG and 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 just uh, and just published, um, which which kind of covers the the concept of having, you know, using the automation and using the composable um, environments to to actually um, create a distributed uh, distributed system which which would. Um, cross failure domains and and be able to automatically survive and and have uh, and have uh, quick recovery processes um, across all of those environments. So there's a lot of exciting things coming up for sure. Yes, sounds absolutely lovely. Um, looking forward to the future as well, then for sure. Um, and then there's a really lovely comment um, from from Hemant Scott saying, "Thanks for the nice presentation. I very much agree. Thank you so much for a really wonderful information packed." Um, <laughs> And um, then also uh, Linux Pizza Cats says hi. Hi back to you, Linux Pizza Cats. Lovely hi, to have Linux. You. <laughs> <laughs> um, big uh portion here um so is there any other questions from the audience now is i think one of your last moments to shoot them away to get anything if there's in your mind um alex do you have any final comments words um things to mention um the one thing i'll say is um storage is kind of becoming ubiquitous in in kubernetes and the whole concept of um you know, not having stateful workloads or not, or or feeling afraid of stateful workloads, I think is something that that should just go away for good. Um, the once once you see the benefits of the automation in Kubernetes, you obviously want to have that automation all the way down um, to every point in your stack, including the storage, and, and that kind of en enables. Uh, you to build anything as a service and to move stateful workloads from traditional environments into Kubernetes as well. I think the other key thing here is um, that um, for the first time, like never before, developers and DevOps teams have
storage systems, right? Which is. I think we're having some technical difficulties. Um, oh, you're back. Perfect. <laughs> yep. There, there was my broadband connection trouble. Thankfully, it didn't happen in demo. I'm so sorry. Um, no worries. It happens. I think every time with these things. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, I was just saying, um, just, just to finish off the comment before we finish that that developers can use storage like a superpower because storage can enable so many use cases. Whether it's, you know, protecting your data, creating highly available. Um, applications um, providing the ability to have data mobility and things like that, which um, which 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 effectively um, they now have the ability to choose on their own because most of these systems are are, are software defined and effectively can be def can be deployed everywhere. So, I'll just end on that note. Perfect. I think it's a really wonderful note to end on. Um, and since there wasn't any immediate new questions. Um, let me just wrap things up for today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining the latest episode of Cloud Native Live. It was really great to have Alex talking about Kubernetes persistent data, the bridge uh, for legacy applications. Thank you so much for being here. Um, thank you. Yes, and we also really love the interaction, the questions from the audience. Thank you, everyone, for commenting, um, attending, and, and being here. So we really bring you the latest Cloud Native Code every Wednesday at 3 p.m. Eastern. So next week, we will have Jason Tiberius presenting Building on HA Control Plane for Tinkerbell with Cube VIP. Thanks for joining us today, and see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Bye.